Hey, it's time for Startup Office Hours. Welcome, I'm Scott Fox. It's time to talk about startups. I hope you're here to join me today to investigate the opportunities that await you in startup land. If you're new to entrepreneurship, we're here to help. I run the Startup Council, which is a worldwide community service group. I'm a volunteer. I've done fairly well as an entrepreneur myself over many decades now as a serial internet entrepreneur. And I'm here today to help answer your questions. We've got people tuning in from all over the world and I'm glad that you're here. If you're watching us on LinkedIn or YouTube or Facebook, any of those places, you can enter questions and uh, comments in the chat room, which we'll bring on here in a minute. And we're going to spend the next hour or so taking your questions live. And if you'd like to join us on camera, let's see, then you would go over to this URL, founderofficehours.com. We've got a bunch of people backstage already who are going to be joining me. And we're going to have some interesting conversations about how you can raise more money for your startup hopefully make a positive impact in the world, create some jobs, create some tax revenues, support your local schools and restaurants, all those good things that come with the growth of new companies. You can also invite your friends. The easiest place to check us out is on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com, as you can see, slash Scott Fox. And there are thousands of people over there watching as well today. And we're happy to have you here. So who am I and why am I got the microphone today? Well, first of all, because I volunteered and I'm doing it which is the key attribute of any entrepreneur, right? you got to just think about something and then go and do it. So I'm here to volunteer to help you. I've been doing this for a long time. I uh, raised my first venture capital round back during Web 1.0, which is a long time ago. And uh, since then, I've been raising money and building companies and advising companies. And now mostly I'm an investor. I'm an angel investor, very active uh, with several different organizations and an LP and a bunch of different funds. I've written these books back here to help you. These are uh, the three in the middle are in English. If you haven't seen any of those yet, uh, Internet Riches, uh, E-Riches 2.0 and Click Millionaires. Those are all books about how an individual, perhaps like you, can look at their own skill set and interests and turn them into online businesses, just as I've done myself uh, many times, in fact. And they're full of case studies. It's not just me talking. They're full of case studies from people around the world who've uh, used the cheaper, better, faster tools that are available online these days to reach large audiences and build sustainable businesses. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how you can build sustainable businesses. So if you've got questions, we're looking forward to hearing from you and uh, you can put them in the chat room. My friends backstage, a bunch of you are there already. I can see if you there's a private chat back there. If any of you could enter in what you want to talk about, that will help me uh, develop our show flow so that it maintains uh, being interesting and leads one topic to the next to help our many uh, listeners and watchers uh, to follow the conversation. Let's see, what else do I need to tell you? This is not qualified legal or financial advice, okay? I'm just some guy that met you on the internet and uh, you should take your uh, the advice here for entertainment purposes, not to build your business and life around. Uh, I'll do my best to help you, but it's up to you to build something. And that's what entrepreneurship is all about, is learning how to build um, scalable businesses. You know, ideas are cheap. I, I read a quote by my friend Seth Godin this morning, and he said something like, remarkable ideas are everywhere. What's lacking is the vision and will to implement them. And that's the fact, right? So um, let's talk today about your ideas, but let's talk more about the questions you have on how you can build those ideas into something uh, that appeals to, I was going to say investors first, but you know, the investors aren't the important part here. The media way overemphasizes that. What you really want to appeal to is customers. Because if you have a great bunch of customers, you don't even need investors, right? Although I know the media portrays this as a venture capital backed kind of world. So I presume that's going to be what a lot of our questions are about today. And I'm happy to help you uh, do that if I can. We, speaking of help, we have a little bit of help. Let's see. Uh, well, here's LinkedIn. You can connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like. Please add a little note. I get deluged on LinkedIn. But if you'd like to say hello, just tell me that you were watching Startup Office Hours. I'd be happy to connect with you. I'm over there at, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, it's linkedin.com slash IN, like in, slash Scott Fox author. This session is being recorded. And so don't say anything stupid <laughs> that you don't want to live forever on the internet. And what else? Um, Let's see, if you're watching this, let's see, no, no, we'll do that one later, sorry. Uh, there was another one I wanted to put up. Do, 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 do. Oh, sponsors, right, okay. So we do have, um, where'd that go? Sponsors, okay. I wanna tell you about my friends at Cake Equity. Cake Equity is a sponsor of this show, and here's their fancy banner, da -da, as if you didn't know how to spell cake, right? CakeEquity.com. What these folks do, and I like this company so much I invested, okay, so I'm fully biased here. But a big problem, and you'll see probably during this very uh, discussion today, 
so many founders have difficulty tracking their investors, developing a capitalization table, allocating stock options, doing the stock option paperwork, especially if it's across borders. Like if you're in the U.S. and say you have employees or team members or contractors that might be, say, in India or Philippines or Estonia or the U.K., whatever, Australia. Um, Cake is really good at this stuff. And in fact, it's free for the first five users. And there's a code on the screen, uh, OCSC20. Um, if you use that link, you'll get 20% off if you then you know upgrade to the fancier service. Of course, as always, um, they need to get paid at some level, but it's really cheap. This is kind of like you might have heard of Carta or Pulley. This is like that, but way cheaper, easier to use, global, um, and, uh, and they're really nice folks too. So that's Cake, cakeequity.com. All right, so go check those out, and I'm sure we'll get to the other ones. They come up kind of naturally. And what else we got here? That's about it. I think it's time to go. Are you guys ready to talk? Let's see. Oh, I need you to turn on your webcams if you're backstage so I can see uh, Hubert and Nadim and Irem and Casey. Uh, let's see. And Ryan and Basim. Okay, there's a, there's Irem turned on her camera. Good. Okay. So I'm going to bring you guys on real quickly. And we're going to do two things here. I'd like you to... Hold on. Let's get the... There we go. I'd like you to really quickly just tell me where you're from. And what it is you want to talk about? Your question, not the whole pitch, but just the question, like the topic, like the table of contents. Okay, so that so that uh, we can um, so I can order the show, like I said. Okay, so let's bring on our friends here, and everybody's gonna smile. There's Basim and Ryan, Casey. If you want to come on, please turn on your camera. And Nadim is coming here, and here's Hubert. Okay, well that's a nice looking crew. Hi, everybody. I guess you can hear me, right? I forgot to do the sound check. I always forget the sound check. Yeah, good. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's hear uh, if you can unmute for just a second and just give me the top line, two sentences, like where you're at. I'm just curious geography. There's no real use for that, but I just get a kick out of it. And the second one is just the top line of what your question is. Just, you know, like, is it about this or is it about that? And let's go. I'll just go in the order I see on my screen. Let's start with um, who's this? Nadim. Hi, Nadim. Yeah, hey Scott, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm from San Jose, and we are a team of two founders in mental health space with uh, you know ARR of 400K with 13 customers and more revenue yes. channels. Uh, yes. We are lacking a team and need investment to build a team. Right, to grow. you said you said so, okay, I got it. Um, Nadim is a winner because he sent this in beforehand, so I actually had a chance to think about that. I appreciate that, you guys. So all of those of you who come back every month. Please send them in early because then I might give you a better answer, right? And of course, oh, I forgot to say, we'll turn on the chat in a second. But everybody who's watching, I want your contributions in the chat room too, right? You can all help each other. I do not have all the answers. I'm just kind of the one with the microphone today. Okay, so Nadine, we will get back to you. Thank you. Uh, how about uh, Irem? Irem, how do you say that? Yeah, Irem from San Jose, yep. California. I'm the second member with Nadim. Oh, okay. Same question. Thank you. Okay, you guys are together, right? Nice to meet you. Okay, and then uh, there's my friend Ryan. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Hi, uh, doing well. I'm Ryan. I'm in Irvine, California, and uh, my core questions really relate to how do you structure equity such that you keep everybody engaged um, and rewarding for team members, especially in the early nebulous phase before you great really question. get something more solid later. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay, good to see you. And that leaves, let's see, we got two left. Um, let's see, Hubert, I'm saving you for last because I know what you are going to ask about. Basim. Hey, Basim. How are you? Okay, Scott. Yes, I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, I'm based out of Los Angeles. Okay. And I have a no code, low code solution. Uh, I'm struggling really to kind of get it started uh, when it comes to fundraising, for example. We have the beta out, but then I'm just trying to see what else can we do. I'm okay. doing a few things here and there, but then, you know, I need some more kind of direction help, uh, just trying to see some advice or something. Okay. You might be our opening question, just to warn you, because that's a nice general intro one, but let's see what else. Uh, Hubert, oh, and here's another gentleman joining us. Mohammed's here too. Hey, Mohammed. Um, Hubert, why don't you uh, let us know what you're Hello, thinking folks. About. How are you doing? Okay. Hey, Hubert. Yes, I'm calling from Hong Kong. I run a B2B SaaS platform. My question is, there's an incubator program that I would like to apply to. And the question is asking me, uh, what worries you as a startup founder? What keeps you up at night? Ah, okay. So that's, yeah, that's a nice one. All right. Well, We'll think about that. And thank you for sending in your question. I have a very clever answer prepared for you. <laughs> Not really, but I did, you did give me a chance to think about it. Uh, Mohammed, how about you? What, where are you from and what, what's on your mind today? 
Hey folks, I'm Mohammed. Uh, I'm 19. I'm the CEO of Fino Agency, a web development agency. Uh, and my question was like, it's not related to invested that much. I'm here to connect and find new people. But my really question was like, how to find a problem for a, for an agency so I can niche down to and help people. With. That's my question. That's an interesting one. I don't think we've had that one before. All right, thanks, Mohammed. Okay, and then Hubert. Oh, Sorry, guys. I'm I'm just trying to get this all together so we can have a coherent uh, conversation together. And let's see, we're going to turn you guys off. And um, all right, good. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Can you all smile just a second and wave or something? We're going to look like we're having a good time. Cool. Thank you. Because, you know, those have to go out on social media or this didn't really happen. Okay, cool. So let's bring, um, let's see, I'm going to take everybody off for a second. And we're just going to turn the chat room on so that we can um, include, oops, sorry, Hubert. I didn't mean to leave you hanging there. There's my friend Hubert. Okay, and then turn on the chat. Okay, so what do we got going on in the chat room? Let's say hello to these folks. So these will start showing up in a second. So um, these are so if you're not if you're watching and you'd like to be in the chat, you can do that over at uh, LinkedIn Live or on YouTube, and those will show up in the chat room. I promise they're about to show up here in a second when they load. There we go. Yep, and there's Ron asking the very question. So here it comes. All right, so let me just check the chat room here. So Ketan, hello, Ketan and Iona and Abdul, good vibes, thank you. Hello from Orlando, Florida, hello. And uh, Ron's from Portland, nice to meet you, Ron. Uh, okay, um, that's a good one, M. Sadi. We can probably get back to that. Shout out from the Philippines, hello, Jean Carlos, nice to see you. Laguna Beach, that's a near right near me. And uh, Larry Suki, I think you are live um, if you're in the chat room. And then how does one ask a question in the back room? Right. Okay. So now we have enough people. Where's the chat room? Okay. So everybody wants to join the chat room. So let's turn that one back on. There's a limit of 10 people backstage. So um, we've already got a majority there. So we're going to kind of roll through those folks uh, ask and answer their questions. But if you would like to join me backstage, happy to meet you. You just need to turn on your web camera and your microphone, of course. And you can go over to founderofficehours.com founderofficehours.com and that will let you in but only it might be full already right so if it's full then just try again in a few minutes and those of you who are backstage if you don't mind once we cover your topic maybe you could leave and go watch on youtube or linkedin or facebook so that other people can come in and ask questions uh let's see what else we got here so uh should mention also our other big sponsor i guess is us the startup council this is an organization i started to try to help all of you and what we do is publicize things like this and hold events and um offer services that help early stage founders. We'll talk about some more of those in a minute, but the best way to get involved is, free, is to go to that URL and get on our email list. And then we'll send you all kinds of cool stuff, not spam, but useful stuff that can help you get your uh, startup moving farther faster. Let's see, I don't think I said that one. And then we're gonna go with, um, let's see, who was that? Basim, okay, I'm gonna bring Basim on here in a second and we're gonna talk about fundraising. So if that's interesting to you, stick around and, um, we will get going here. Just a reminder, this is not confidential and this is not, uh, I'm not a super genius. I do not have all the answers. So please don't take this too seriously <laughs> and rely on this. Um, and of course the other, um, the other asset that we have here is everybody in the chat room. So there's uh, dozens of you watching right now. So if somebody says something online or on the, in our chat, uh, please go ahead and help them. The idea of this is a give first sort of show. So if you have something to add, please do. I'm not an expert on everything and we welcome your participation in the chat room. All right, enough of all that. So who did I say was first? Vasim, I think. Let's go find Vasim and we'll talk, dig into his. There he is. He's waving. Thank you, Vasim. That helps. Okay. All right. So Vasim, so let's hear a little more about uh, the context of your question. And then uh, if you can sum up the question for anybody who just arrived as well. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Uh, now, this is a no-code, low-code startup. Uh, we are trying to kind of help, uh, you know, businesses digitize their operations end-to-end. -end. And uh, I'm at a very early stage. The beta is launched now, so, uh, but then I think I'm finding it hard, uh, though I'm pursuing this actively, but I'm not seeing any, I think, progress, I think, if, if that's the way, if, if I can put it. So I'm trying to see what works. Like, for example, I speak to someone like an agent investor, for example, or somebody else, some other agency, stuff like that. So what really works? I mean, you know, I know I still have to get my marketing going and other things going, but then just want to see from your perspective what works. I know there's a lot of hard work required, 
But then I'm trying to see, okay, is there something I should be doing, focusing more on, for example, to kind of get our you know, game plan works well. Great. That's a great question. I think that's probably of interest to a lot of people here. So thank you for joining us. Um, let me ask a qualifying question. Are you asking more about how to find investors in the first place or more once you find someone, what to talk to them about? I would like to hear both, by the way. But then finding is a difficult part, of course. I'm okay. struggling with that. So I did find a few, but then I'm probably not finding the right people. That's possible. Okay. But right. then, yeah. Okay, well, I guess we can try to do both of those, and I can see some other folks here. Let me bring on JW as well. JW, thank you for typing in in the back there that you wanted to talk about finding in front of investors as well. Maybe we can have a kind of a three-way conversation. Okay, hi, there's JW. Hi, JW. Where What's happening? I'm in uh, Calabasas, California. Okay, we got a California in the house tonight or today. <laughs> All right, nice to meet you. So you wanted to talk about a similar topic, it sounded like. Yeah, I have a product that at least at MVP level and I'm kind of at a crossroads and I need to find my next investor. Right. OK, so let's start with that and then we'll go. Uh, I seem you had a two part question, so we'll try to do that as well. And you guys chime in if I'm off course and just wave your hands if I keep talking too long. OK, um, OK, so finding investors is is obviously a difficult thing. And, and the key thing, Vasim, I really like the way you phrased that. I don't even know if you did it, but this is the key is to not just find investors, but you said the right investors. And that is the game, folks. There are a million investors these days. In fact, everybody and their brother and sister these days claims to be an investor, right? Because um, especially with crypto and stuff, everybody's throwing money around. I mean, not like they were a couple of years ago, but everybody seems to be an angel investor. And it's really hard to tell a good one from a bad one or one who's just making shit up, right? So research is the key. That's the short answer. Um, you need to find the right investors. And so many people, I'm going to say this the right way, so many founders are like I used to be. You didn't know the venture world, but you knew your product world, right? So you're really good at this. And then you kind of walk over across the street into investor land and, and you do your research and, and you really don't know A from B from C. You don't have that filter that you would have in your own domain field, right? And the research is the key because not all money is the same. Uh, and I'm literally writing a book about this, but I guess, and you, and I apologize, you two might know this already, but I'm just trying to, you know, get everybody on the same page who's listening and watching. Venture capitalists are different than angel investors. Angel investors, there's a hundred types and venture capitalists has a hundred types as well. So just because somebody has a business card with dollar signs on it, doesn't necessarily mean that they're investing in you compared to the much larger business of stock market investing in the bond market and real estate and all these other traditional asset classes. It is a very small world, but it's still there are thousands and thousands of investors. So your job is to do as much research to find the right people, because the trick is you can't just talk to 10 investors and think that you're going to get 10 legitimate answers. Three of them are going to be fake. Two or three are going to invest at later stages or earlier stages than you are. And maybe all of them don't invest in your field. Right. So it's it's really hard. But the way to improve your hit ratio is to do a crap load of research first. 10 years ago, people used to buy spam lists of investors, right? And they'd send out like a thousand emails, you know, spray and pray and, and hope to get a few back. And that kind of almost worked because the venture capital world was small. And anyone who even knew what an angel investor was probably was an angel investor, right? It used to be a small business. But now there's just so many that you have to do your research first. It's a lot more, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like buying a car. You don't just go out and buy any car, right? You think about, do I want an SUV? Do I want a sports car? Do I need a minivan for my kids? And then which dealer has the best brand, you know, with the best service and the best, you know, rankings and what's the right price. And you got to do that kind of thing with investors as well. So I apologize if that's too basic for anybody, but people miss that step a lot. They meet somebody at a conference and say, oh, you're a venture capitalist. You've got to invest in this. What do you mean you're not interested? Well, I'm a late stage aerospace investor and you're an early stage medical device startup, right? I mean, these are different things. So anyway, that's a long answer. Um, hopefully, was that helpful at all? I, I'm going to keep going. I have something more specific, but is that, I just want to set the stage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let me be more specific. So where this really hits the road is you need to find comparables. You need to find companies that have been in your field that have been, um, have had success, right? You need to find other investments so that you can say, to an investor like me. So you meet me at a conference and you say, I have such and such a product and we're making this kind of money. I'm like, okay, so what? Right. Um, you don't know me. You're just throwing, you're just throwing stuff at the wall. Right. 
what you need to say is, hey, Scott, hey, I looked at your portfolio on AngelList and I see that you invest in these kinds of companies. Oh, I'm like, okay, I appreciate that. You did some research, all right. Um, and in fact, I have a company, uh, let's call it uh, the banana company. My banana company is a lot like these three other companies. And I saw that those each raised this kind of amount of money at this stage of growth. And then they had an exit or an acquisition like this. And it looks like their investors got 48 times their money. That's what we're doing. Now I'm interested, right? Because it, like you've done, you've honed in on what I'm looking for and you've provided examples and also demonstrated your business savvy as you know this market and what people like me look for. And you have to adjust all that depending on whether they're a VC or an angel, how big the amount you're raising is, how far along you are. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is really complicated stuff, but that's the piece most people miss. Okay, one more thought, and then I wanna hear from you guys if I'm making sense at all. Believe it or not, this is such a problem that we went and built something for you. So this is a bit of a commercial, but this is because I hear this question all the time. There, that's my very high tech commercial. Startup investors directory to come. Guess what it is? It's a directory of startup investors <laughs> because this is so hard. And I've been in your shoes and now I'm on both sides, right? I work with companies. I invest in companies. I've raised money. You know, I invest money. And what's really hard, especially for folks like you guys, I guess, and probably a lot of you watching, and I hear this every, I've been doing this for years, right? This is the same question we get all the time. How do I find the investors? And now Asim said it right, the right investors. You need to find a database that you can afford. There's a big one called PitchBook, which costs thousands of dollars. This is, I think it's $79. I mean, we made it just to cover the cost, right? And let me, I'll even put up the coupon code. We're just testing this, right? But we have over 3,000 investors there all early stage, and we categorize it 48 different ways. Plus there's keyword search. So oh, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. So where to go? Uh, that's not it, there it is. Okay, so there's a code you can use. Uh, and that's half off or free or something, I don't even know. We're not trying to make money, we're just covering costs, right? It's taken three years to build. Um, but here's, so here's the real answer to your question. Find a resource like this, and you don't have to use this, just go use Google, there's plenty of information out there, or use Edgar. E-D-G-A-R, which is the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission's database. That's free. The Edgar database at, SC, at the SEC. Um, that's only for public companies, though, right? But you can find the filings of any company that went public, and then hopefully you can dig in and learn more about their earlier rounds. But my point is, you go and you find companies that look like yours, and then you find the invest. Here's the next piece. You find the investors that invested in those companies, and, and then you call them up and you say, hey, it's like you made a bunch of money over here on Banana Company. We're going to be the next banana company. Want to have coffee? And that's going to way improve your hit ratio. All right. Sorry. That was a much longer answer than anybody wanted, but I get excited about this. Now, this is what I do, right? So what, how does, is that uh, JW or, or Vaseem? Is, is this useful? That made total sense. Thanks, Scott. I really yeah. make sense. I appreciate that answer. Yes. Great. Great. I'm awesome. JW, what do you think? Any, any questions or follow up or? Well, yeah, I guess uh, the code is SID launch. Is that what it says? Yeah, SID, uh, Startup Investors Directory launch. Yeah, good, give it a shot. And if you're not okay. happy, we'll give you your money back. We're just trying to cover costs. And I'm I'm trying what, one of the reasons I do this show, I skipped this part at the beginning, is I hate gatekeeping. I went to, I went to grad school at Stanford back in the 90s. I was lucky enough to be in the right place when the internet was basically invented. Not really, but like commercialized, right? And I grew with that. But so many people have made so much money in Silicon Valley and all they do is end up talking to each other and investing in each other's deals. And that is wrong. It's just amoral bullshit, right? This is the greatest opportunity in history for everybody to get involved. I mean, you can reach the freaking planet. I'm doing this for, I pay like $20 a month for this service and I'm reaching people all over the world. Like every one of you can do this. That's what my books are about. Um, so I'm built, we're building these tools so that you can have a shot at acts, the kind of access that I have. Right. And it's taken me decades to get this access. So I'm trying to help you guys, too. Anyway, um, sorry. <laughs> you can tell this is my my uh, this, this is a song I was born to sing. OK, so I guess we should bring somebody else on because we've taken a bunch of time there. Um, but Vasim, you had a second question. What was the second part of that question? I've, there was something. Uh, yeah, the first part was uh, where to find or how to find investors. And then I think yeah. the second part is just the second part, how to kind of maybe the strategy, for example. Oh, right. OK. And you did touch on it. I think, but if there's more, you could please add to it. Sure, I'll hit that too. I'm going to let you guys go, but you can still listen. Um, and I'll just answer that quickly because that's a quicker answer, actually. And then we're going to bring on some more questions. Uh, and hi to everybody in the chat room who's just joining us. I'm Scott Fox from the Startup Council. 
if you're not on our email list, please join us, uh, startupcouncil.org. Uh, we do a whole bunch of cool stuff for free and low cost to try to help founders like you. Okay, so the second part of Asim's question was, what do investors want to hear? I think that's probably a fair summary of what he's asking. Um, here's the trick. Uh, entrepreneur, you know, got to change your mindset a little bit. As an entrepreneur, you are rightly very enthusiastic about the mission that you have chosen. And you have to be. Absolutely, right? You're curing cancer. You're going to the moon. You're improving productivity. You're whatever it is, right? I mean, you're excited about this and you need to be. That enthusiasm is one big part of it. But pitching the product is not what investors want to hear. Investors don't really care about the product unless you've done a lot of research like we just talked about and you found investors who are really in your niche, then they're all they're going to get what you're talking about quickly. Right. And they might be excited about it, especially if they're a former founder in that space. That's cool. Right. And that's exactly who you want to be pitching to, by the way. <laughs> um, but in general, if you meet an investor, uh, especially um, an angel investor, we kind of we're kind of opportunistic. Right. We're just looking at stuff in general. And we're comparing, you know, real estate to the stock market to, uh, you know, investing in your kid's college fund or, you know, cl classic cars. And we're looking at all kinds of different stuff. So the fact that you are dedicated to this mission and this product isn't necessarily so influential to an angel investor. It may be more so to a venture capital firm who has a defined thesis. So whenever you find a firm that you want, may be interested in, you may want to work with, go to their website and see. They will tell you what they're looking for. So like I said earlier, if they're a late stage aerospace fund, don't even waste your time pitching them your medical device, right? That's just, you're wasting everybody's time. So first of all, you have to figure out what they're interested in and use your enthusiasm, but not for the product. Here's the answer. You need to demonstrate growth. Growth. That's what investors are looking at. If you are growing, that answers all the questions, right? You are growing and ideally growing in, this, in terms of revenue and even better in terms of profit. If you're growing a lot in terms of profit, you probably don't even need money, but, but that's, a, that's a safer bet for us, right? We're risk averse. So what you need to figure out, uh, Vasim and everybody else, is what is it about your company? Even if you're super early stage, what is it about your company that, that you can demonstrate some pattern that looks attractive to an investor? And the, what we do as investors is pattern matching, right? We're looking for patterns. Just like I was saying earlier, oh, that's a company that did well like this company. Ah, that's a pattern I like. I'm interested, right? So what can you say about your company? If you're farther along and you have a bunch of uh, ARR, annually recurring revenue, or you have a bunch of customer signups, great, right? Talk about the growth rate. If you don't have those yet, what can you do? This is my challenge to you guys. What can you do to demonstrate growth? Even if you don't have any money, you could buy some ads on Facebook and see if anybody clicks. You could hold a cocktail party and see how many people sign up on the clipboard asking if they're interested. You know, that kind of stuff, like just stuff that isn't even really scalable, perhaps, but something that shows you have traction. And the best and really the only traction that matters these days is customers. Customers. You can't just build something in your ivory tower that you think solves the world's problems, but you haven't engaged with any customers. You need to talk to customers. So I would much rather have you show up at a presentation like I'm part of Tech Coast Angels, which is one of the biggest angel groups in the United States. And at our Tech Coast Angels screenings, which we have every couple of weeks, and if you're interested in applying to Tech Coast Angels, I should say techcoastangels.com. <laughs> Go to techcoastangels.com. Um, I would we would much rather hear you, the typical pitch is I have this idea. We have built this product. We're all this cool stuff. Now we need your money to market it. Like, okay, that's not stupid. I mean, looks cool, a cool product. You seem smart, um, but you want us to write you a check to market it. How many customers have you talked to? Oh, I don't know, but we know I've been in this business for years. I know all the customers. Okay, so go talk to one, right? How many customers have you talked to? Show me that somebody other than you gives a shit. That's the kind of growth you want to show. All right, so I said that was going to be a short answer, but it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so let's go back to... Uh, let's hit our chat room here for a minute and see how uh, other folks have arrived to join us. And, um, oh, you know, let me put this up. I put up a page. This is a page. After what I do these shows, people tend to email me and LinkedIn me and everything. And that's great. I'm happy to help if I can. If you ask a short question, I don't do coffees and lunches. And, you know, I, I will if you really want to pay for it. But I don't I, the only way I can manage my time is to charge for it, right? But this page I put up, this is recommendations of several of the groups like Tech Coast Angels. 
that I just mentioned that I'm involved in who are open to early stage projects. So if that's useful to you, go check it out. Uh, let me just visit our chat room here for a second here and see what our friends from all over. Hey, everybody, tell me where you're from, by the way. That, Like I said, I always get a kick out of that. It's um, okay. We have the Philippines and Laguna Beach and um, let's see, San Francisco. Cool. And Patrick, is that the same Patrick you were pitched at our event last month? You're, I thought you were, I guess you were up north. Huh? I thought you were down here. Um, anyway, let's see. Uh, Daniel from Canada, but who is in Romania. Okay, getting around. Um, okay, Lake Forest, that's nearby. LA County, excellent. Uh, SID Launch, yes, that's right. SID Launch was the, the code I put up. Denver, Colorado, hello, Harsh. And Andre from Herndon, you've been here before, right, Andre? And uh, Valencia, all from Spain. I was in Spain. Oh, yeah, beautiful, beautiful place. Okay. Let's see. And Mohammed, you're from Turkey. Very cool. It's been a while since I've been to Istanbul, but that is a cool city. All right. Let me hit a couple of the questions in the chat room just so we can kind of keep up. Let's see. Osama says, proper approach for international fundraising. I'm a founder of an EHR cloud-based solution ready to go. International. That's an interesting question, Osama. Of course, we'd have to know a lot more. But um, it depends on what country you're, you know, the money's coming from and what country you're in. So I can't really answer that. But I will tell you, U.S. investors, which is where most of the money is these days, are hesitant to invest overseas, and this includes myself, unless you have a U.S.-based company. Why? Not just because we're not xenophobic or anything. I mean, I love, I just said a minute ago how much I love Spain, for example, right? I mean, I travel as much as I can. I'll be in Australia next month. Um, but it's because it's hard for us to get the money back, right? If the money is in you know, Turkish lira or Aussie dollars, whatever it is, um, legally and tax wise, it's just very complex for us. So if you want to raise money internationally, meaning that you are non us based founder and you want to raise money from us investors, what you need to do is set up a C corporation. There's many different kinds of corporations in the United States and you want a C corporation like this, or is it like this, <laughs> um, in Delaware, Delaware is one of the United States and it's the most, uh, corporate friendly legal structure. So that's what venture capitalists and uh, corporations that go public prefer, a Delaware C-Corp. If you are a Delaware C-Corp, you will greatly increase your chance of raising money from U.S. investors. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, John Carlos, yes, you emailed in. If you want to go backstage, you're welcome to join us. We can try to cover that about uh, founder uh, equity shares. In fact, I think Ryan had a similar question, so we might cover that anyway. Um, Joseph Curiel, greetings. I work with college students taking entrepreneurship classes. I want to introduce the students to your organization. Hi, Joe. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Like to love to reach the students. Please tell us where you are. Or you're, oh, you're in LA. Okay. So what's cool? Uh, happy to hear from you folks. Berlin. Excellent. Um, all right. I'm catching up here. Daniel Sarlu wanted to, oh, starting a business incubator. Great. Oh, and you're the one in Romania, right? I want to thank you for what to do, including with helping find smaller pockets. Beautiful mission. The world needs you. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. Well, you too, if you're actually out there doing the work, right? There's this emerging layer of people who volunteer a lot of time to help entrepreneurs make it. And it sounds like you're one of them. So yeah, great to, great to have you here. Thank you. And please share this and like this and follow us and all that stuff, right? Tampa, Florida, Denver, Colorado, uh, Toronto, Riverside. Where would you recommend registering? Okay, there we are. Iona. You've been here before too, I think, Iona, right? Where would you recommend raising income in the U.S. once to raise money in the U.S.? Delaware. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Yes, just answer. Okay, I'm caught up on the chat. Let's get backstage again and see what our friends backstage want to say. Um, okay, we did Vasim and we got JW as well. Now, um, Nadim had a complicated question. Ryan, Hubert, uh, let's see, that had the incubator question. Okay, let's, um, well, Ryan, let's bring Ryan on because um, someone else in there, the Southwest of France. Bonjour, Emile Camille. C'était à Paris il y a trois semaines. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, let's, what did I just say? Ryan, there he is. Okay. So somebody else asked a similar question. Here comes Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Nice to see you. Yeah, great to see you as well. Um, it's very similar to John Carlos's question in the chat as well. Um, okay. Maybe his was a little better worded. But uh, how do you organize and structure a company, especially at the early stage when you're not clear what angels might come through and when you've got a team and you're not sure how committed everyone is um, yep. such that though if things go well everyone will be rewarded and uh, be happy with what ends up happening sure no great question and, and a common one 
um, that's so important and people neglect this one. I always like to answer this question, even though it's the same answer pretty much every time, because people miss this, they just get screwed. Everything falls apart, right? The founders fight or somebody leaves or the investors come in and dilute the crap out of everybody. And you, your whole thing can really go off the rails if you don't take care of some basic paperwork. And you're smart enough to know that. Ryan has a PhD from Stanford, everybody. So he's obviously a smart guy. Um, okay. So um, the answer is, first of all, pay attention to it, which is check. We got that right. Pay attention to this. This is important. You're getting married. So you want to figure out and have a thorough discussion with all your founders. Who's going to do what? Um, and not just that, the other piece that people often miss is for how long and what if things change. And those are the crucial parts of a contract. And that's why, honestly, attorneys are really valuable at this stage. It seems stupid to spend money when you don't have money. But this is a key part to really nail down, because one of the first things that investors will ask you if they like your company is they want to see what's called the data room. And the data room is basically a cloud, a Dropbox or a Google Drive account or something that has all the documentation that, about your company. And it would have a Delaware C Corp um, like Iona asked about um, and that it has uh, appropriate agreements with all the team members. Everyone who ever touched your code or your copyrights or your designs or anything that you're making that's proprietary, that all has to be in the data room signed, right? Not just verbal. We want to see all that locked down because we don't want to put money in and then have somebody sue you and say, you know, even Facebook had that problem, right? I don't know if you guys remember, but there was some guy that popped up like five years after Facebook started and say, hey, you owe me a billion dollars. And you know, that's a mess for everybody. So um, expectations management is the key. And I have two specific uh, suggestions. Um, here's one of them. This is a book and a website, and I keep it right here for exactly this uh, this eventuality. This is called Slicing the Pie, Perfect Splits for Startups. And there's a website, too, um, slicingpie.com, I guess, slicingpie.com. So this has got, like, some questions and stuff, and you can ask uh, to you and your founders, and it gives you a framework to have the discussion, right? Because everybody thinks they're more valuable than they are. And everybody wants more than they probably really deserve. And you need to have those discussions. So I, I recommend this one, Slicing Pie. There's another one that people have told me about in the past. And actually, this is a great, uh, let's crowdsource this a little bit. Anybody in the chat room has a suggestion about how to do this or resources, please put in some URLs or offer your opinion. I totally, uh, I don't have a monopoly on this at all. But the other one, this is from a, uh, a previous um, a session of this, somebody said comparably.com, comparably, like ending in B-L-Y, comparably.com. I guess that might be something similar. Uh, so I would go look at those. And then the other one is, uh, again, I, I like and I invest in things that solve these problems is this, cakeequity.com. Uh, Cake Equity is a company that manages uh, start uh, startup capitalization tables. So that's where you list all your um all your shareholders, and then they will help you. They have all the stuff, automated template stuff. Um, oh, look at that. I'm going to do the fade. Da -da 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 -da. There you go. Da -da -da. Um, to issue stock options letters. And it's all just point and click. It's the way it should be, not like paying attorneys 25 grand to set up all your stuff. Uh, and I've, I've used it myself because I'm a shareholder in Cake, and I've issued it. It really works. So, And that's cheap. Let me put up their thing again, actually. There it is. Okay, that's another discount for you guys. Um, and then, so then, Ryan, uh, hopefully I'm on the right track here. Let me add a third point, and then I want to hear from you if there's follow-up questions. And, and those of you in the chat room are welcome, of course, as well. Um, the piece that people usually miss is the time element because people may be involved a lot now, but their involvement level may change later. So you never give stock to anybody without a vesting schedule. So in this, honestly, to be fair, should include you. Right. Because if you're the end up being the weakest link, say you have it's you and a couple partners, let's, for example, sake, let's say there's three of you. Right. And uh, a year in one of them uh, decides to move or gets pregnant, you know, and take some time off and may come back later or whatever. Or and then you decide, you know, you didn't like this after all. And you went and go join the army or whatever it is you do. Right. Everybody life happens. Right. So everything should have a vesting schedule and everybody earns back their um, their stock over some period of time. Um, usually it's like four years. And that sounds, um, I don't know, disruptive or insulting if you're the founder. Uh, but investors will often ask for that as well. Just be warned, right? When we come and we're going to put in 5 million bucks or something, uh, oftentimes investors will ask you to start over 
on your own stock. So this is not as unusual as it sounds and you might as well get used to it. <laughs> okay. So how's that? Was that useful? Uh, yeah, Brian? that's pretty good. We got pay attention. It's like you're getting married and you need to set up for how long you got the data room and to keep all the documentation and stakeholder agreements signed. Yeah. And then uh, you mentioned a couple of good books, slicing the pie handbook, comparably.com and cake equity. Yeah. There you go. Nice summary. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. No, it's all great advice. Thank you. All right. Good. Good to see you. All right. So that's our friend Ryan. And then um, what else we got going on here? All right. We're going to get on to some next questions. Um, oh, here's another service we launched recently. This is completely free. I figured out that there are lots of events like this for you and they're all over the world. And especially if you don't live in Palo Alto or New York City or London or Mumbai, you know, a big city, there are all kinds of cool things going on on YouTube and everywhere else that you can sign up for free. So this is another thing we started. This is free. You go and join this email list and it will send you emails about new events that are designed to help startup founders. So genius, right? <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. Uh, but if, and, and if you're a part of events and you want them featured, send them to us. Uh, we'll post them for free. And it's, um, it's designed specifically, they're all virtual events. As far as I know, it's the first calendar anywhere of only virtual events, only for startup founders. So hopefully it can um, introduce you to more resources like this one that we're creating right now. All right, so let's see. We did JD, we did, okay, we're waiting for, and then we did Ryan. All right, let's talk to Nadim and Iram. And they, if they're still here, sorry, this takes always takes a while. Um, oh, oh, Kian, let's see. Kian came in backstage too. Let's see, Kian, did you type, hold on, Iram, and there's Iram, and here's Nadim. And these guys have an interesting challenge. Um, if you guys don't mind, can you summarize for the group what uh, what it is you'd like to talk about? Sure. Um, I have a two-part question, Scott. So the first one is that we are two people shop with close to half a million revenue in year two and 13 customers. We have grown by 100% since year one. What we are lacking is a team and we need investment to build a team to accelerate now. Wow. Uh, and I wanted to understand, you know, and this is a generic question, but how do we look from your perspective and investors' perspective? Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations. That's the story everybody wants to be able to tell. That is that's freaking cool. Everybody in the chat room should be giving you a hand. Um, so, okay. So you've got real ARR. ARR for everybody is annually recurring revenue. Um, you generally start with a, uh, MRR, monthly recurring revenue, but that's some of the acronyms that investors like to throw around. Um, so developing something, well, tell me a little more about why you need the team, just so I kind of understand. If you're already making money, what what is what is it that you need to scale? Yeah, yeah. so so we are in mental health space and uh, we have an outsourced uh, technology team. So we want to bring that in-house, so we need engineers. And then uh, what we do is we also uh, have wellness coaches, which provide the services component of along with the software that we offer to our customers. So we need to hire more wellness coaches as well, and they need to be full-time. So those are our two main uh, costs that we are looking at uh, to incur, and those will add up quite a bit. Right, right, okay, so that makes sense. Yeah. So you already have a team, it's just that they're outsourced, and you wanna raise money to keep them engaged right. and then bring them in-house. Okay, yes. Okay. okay, well, that's better than not having a team at all. I wondered how you did that. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Okay, so sorry, I have to keep running these little chirons while we're talking here. Uh, there. Okay, so how do you look through investors? So, my first question, obviously, well, where did the team come from, right? It wasn't just you guys building it. This you have an existing team, so that makes more sense. I understand better now. Um, the fact that you have ARR is fantastic. At four hundred thousand, right? That's what, like thirty grand a month, thirty-five grand a month. Um, that's real money. Um, that's enough to create a company with, which is great. You've passed the next test. Uh, you have real traction and this is actual customers. My next question would be how recurring is it? And you say it's ARR. So most of that is recurring, not one-time services revenue. Okay, good, mm -hmm. good. Um, and again, that's what investors are looking for. So the next question will be what kind of growth rate are you seeing? Mm -hmm. Or did you say that? Sorry, I was doing so a couple things at once. <laughs> So between year one and year two, we have grown by 100%. Nice. 
in terms of revenue. Okay, great. All right. So there's, this has all the earmarks. This is what all of you listening should be trying to do, <laughs> basically. So um, ni nice work. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Okay. So I think there's two parts of what you're saying, at least in terms of uh, how an investor would look at this. The technology part is the high multiple and the people part is the less high, the lower multiple. Services that scale based on humans don't scale as fast as software does. So I would be looking at your use of funds and how much of that, I was sort of be splitting it into two separate milestones. Um, if, if we, how much money are we talking about you would raise just theoretically? A million dollars or what are you looking at? Close to a million dollars. a million yes. just to make it easy. So I'd be interested in the mix of how you saw that used. If you're going to be 500 on um, software team and 500 on more wellness coaches or, you know, 70, 30 or 90, 10 or what. And then given that, say, if it was 100 grand over here and 900 over here, did the respective growth rates in terms of revenue uh, reflect that investment appropriately? And of course, with tech, there's a certain amount of fixed cost you have to do just to get things moving. I understand that, but I'd be looking to separate out fixed and variable costs and then seeing what I get for the money, essentially. That's what it really boils down to. Everybody needs to think, uh, stop thinking about investors like a bank, right? We don't just write checks and then hope to get repaid someday. We're looking at a specific return for investment, right? So if this million dollars goes in, I'd like to know what I'm really saying is, how are you going to spend it? And when do I get my money back and how much, right? So time and return. And if your ratio is like 900 on the people and 100 on the tech, at least for me, I'm a software guy, I'll be less interested because you're going to have to hire a lot of people. And the best you can do with people is bill hourly, essentially, right? Um, whereas software, if, for example, you could replace all those those terrible people with AI and AI could do it all, which I'm sure you've thought about, right? Have you thought about that? <laughs> um, that, um, you know, that would scale a lot faster because if you had an AI built, if you put that 900 into an AI and then the AI, AI could do the job of a thousand coaches, boom, right? You're your rocket ship for your revenues. So that would be kind of how I would be looking at it and the things I'd be looking at in your, in the due diligence. Um, is this helpful? Yes, th this is helpful, Scott. And you, you answered my second question. Oh, okay, well. good. And what, what was that yeah. one? It was about uh, the fact that you know we provide software with a service component, mm -hmm. and which by service I mean not SaaS, but you know wellness coaches. Yeah. So real humans are involved, and do tech investors generally shy away from startups with a service component that is provided yes. by humans? Unfortunately, yes, which kind of sucks for all us humans, right? <laughs> but uh, but they um, yes, it just doesn't scale as fast, right? Um, and it, the more yeah. you can lean on software that's replicatable and recurring. The, the more you'll get, it's not so much, it's a different kind of investor, I guess, because you said the right word, tech investor. So software investors, to be more specific, we're looking for that because that's what we specialize in. There are plenty of really good businesses and plenty of good investors who invest in things that don't scale as well, like um, like real estate or people that make tractors or farms. I mean, restaurants, right? Those are, those are all much more human and physically intensive businesses. Uh, they tend to have lower multiples though. And a multiple you may know this, but since I brought it up uh, for the audience, a multiple is what investors, they'll say, um, like like these folks here on the screen, they're doing 400, a, uh, it was a year, right? ARR, uh, 400 a year. Yeah. So we, it's kind of a shorthand for how fast we think this company is going to grow. So if it's 400, we might put a multiple, say, of 10 on that, meaning that we think if we invested in this company and it lived for a few years and then had some sort of exit like a... a an acquisition or a going public, you might say it was a, a 10 or even uh, so 10. So it might be worth like 4 million. Just just rough comp, right? Mm -hmm. And if it was AI powered, yep. like we said, we could get rid of all the people, then that might be 20, right? So that might be an $8 million comparable. Whereas if you said, this is, uh, we have no tech, we're doing this all just with uh, telephones and 1-800 numbers, like they would have done it in the 80s. Uh, and, it, and we, but we have a staff of like 400 coaches, then the multiple might be like four. Right, because we can see it growing, but you're just going to have to hire and train so many people, and you're going to have so much churn in terms of the humans that um, it's going to really uh, put a drag on profits. So, okay, All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. Nice to see you guys. I'd love to hear more about the. You know, I, you you were, you were very polite. You didn't even say what your company is. You're certainly welcome to tell us or put it in the chat room if you'd like people to check it. Are you looking for customers? Are you open to the public at this point, or? 
Um, yeah, we're looking for customers. We actually, the customers are not our problem. We have, we have plenty of customers and we actually have uh, channels of unexplored territories. So um, I did have a follow-up question. Now, hold on, hold on. I just want to, that, that was the, hold on, wait, no, that, hold on. Did you hear what she just said? That was the answer every investor wants to hear. Customers are not the problem. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. So, you know, um, as Nadim was explaining, uh, there is a tech component to it. Um, the scalability aspect sounds like we would have to lean towards more of the, the piece, which is um, not actually involving the humans. Um, and we do have that aspect. But I think where we're needing that funding to come in is, you know, we are just a two person uh, party, literally. And our tech team is sort of offshores. But we do need sort of in-house support not just with the tech piece but also with the human centric piece so i mean we're kind of looking into the funding aspect and you mentioned if we were to show the ratios to kind of say hey we need x amount of dollars for um the piece that could be the more scalable piece that would look a little bit more enticing yes okay yeah, that's exactly what i said yep and there is a realization I and mean, this is the other thing investors well there's two different kinds of investors i guess there's investors who just do finance and don't have never run a business which are not as good to have as partners, at least at the early stage. Uh, if you can find investors who are operators themselves, like me, for example, I've built and run startups, right? Um, we'll understand that, yeah, you need a couple real people, right? But the, we're not, we're not, I'm not saying you can't hire any humans. Like you need, you know, you need somebody to do some marketing or biz dev, or you need somebody to do some admin so that you don't spend your time booking plane flights, you know, like you need a few people, right? We just, we just don't want to see that like you're, you're going to start paying yourselves a million dollars each and you're going to hire like 60 people when your revenues don't support that. Right. But there is some there's there's a, it's kind of a step function with early stage companies. Right. You're two people and then you're probably three or four and then you might go to eight and then you might go to 16 and then you go. Right. And then you go to 20 or 100. But hopefully you don't go to 10,000. Right. Because that's a different model. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Cool. Oh, great. Nice to meet you guys. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Scott. Thanks. Bye. Okay. So those are some fr new friends from San Jose, California. Nice to meet them. And who do we have backstage here? I haven't talked to yet. Let's see. Kian and Hubert and Muhammad. Okay. I'm, I'm just, hold on, everybody. I'm just reading in the backstage. Kian, what he wants to talk about. Okay. Okay, that's an interesting question, Kian. Um, let's do that. And then, well, let me get to Hubert because I know it's the middle of the night for Hubert because um, he's in Hong Kong. Well, what was the company name? That's right. Thank you, uh, Maud Shanawaz. If you guys, um, Iram and, uh, and Nadim, if you want to put your um, company name in there, that's I think everybody would be interested. I can learn from you. Um, and let's see. So Kian. All right, let's bring Kian. Oh, no, I said I was going to do Hubert. Sorry, guys. A lot of you in the chat room. Uh, this is an example of the step function. One of these days I'll hire a producer. <laughs> so I don't do this all myself at the same time. Okay. So here's my friend Hubert. Hey, Hubert. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. So nice Hubert, to see you. Hubert is one of the smartest people I know because he shows up in the middle of the night from Hong Kong every month and ask me really hard questions and gets free advice. And I think that hopefully it's helpful that he keeps showing up. So nice to see you, Hubert. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm a huge fan. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, let's uh, talk about your, it was an incubator you're applying to, right? And uh, yes. everybody, when he asks his question, go ahead and chime in as well. So um, the question is, uh, what keeps you up at night uh, and uh, what worries you? I don't want to be too honest uh, because, you know, most pre-seed um, startups, uh, their honest answer is product market fit and it's run out of money. But uh, I don't want to come up with some nonsense answers too. So I uh, would love to have uh, your feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so he's interviewing with an incubator and they're asking him tough questions. And this is like a standard interview question any of us got when we interviewed for a job, right? Uh, or at least a, well, yeah. Um, so I think this is one of those places where you spin a little bit and everybody's going to know you're spinning. But part of the reason they ask the question is just to see how you handle ambiguous questions, right? So nobody's expecting a real answer. What they're looking for is for you to identify existential threats that might be unique to your industry and maybe learn something. And then second, 
they're asking to see how well you can dance, <laughs> right? So first of all, I would think about your industry and um, what there might be. Like, and obviously, as I recall, your business um, productivity software for ed, ed tech, so, something like that, right? Yes. Um, uh, you know, AI, right? I mean, everybody's going to say AI these days, right? And and honestly, that's such a good answer. It's almost a non-answer, right? But if you could unpack that a little and say something about the unique application of AI in your field, uh, maybe in a way that they hadn't thought about, that would be an interesting answer. And I think that doesn't reflect poorly on you because nobody knows what the hell's going to happen with AI, right? You could say almost oh, anything, and and you, you know, if you sound smart about it. So I would be thinking about things, not just the obvious. You've thought about these things, so they're probably obvious to you. But I'm just making this up. But like something about how AI might not just impact your business, but, but how it might change customer behavior, right? Or how it might change the long-term investing outlook for your space or something that's just, you know, kind of a second order question about how AI might affect it. Then of course, competitors I always want to hear um, acknowledgement of competitors. One of the biggest recurring mistakes I see for early stage founders is that they don't acknowledge competitors. Everybody thinks that their own thing, that they're, you know, we're the only people that do this. And uh, that's rarely true. Just because you don't know it's being done it doesn't mean it isn't being done because we see a lot more businesses than you do because you're busy building a business. We're busy shopping. <laughs> so you got to be careful about that. Uh, and also there, um, the recognition that investors, they don't really, they're not interested in your thing as deeply as you are. Like I said earlier, they're looking at a variety of things. So what may not seem like a competitor to you may be a competitor in my eyes because it's kind of the same field and they're growing a lot faster than you are so you wouldn't necessarily see them as a competitor but as an alternative investment minimizing the risk for me and and my limited partners who invest in me if i was a venture capital firm um you got to be aware of that then my third and final answer <laughs> would be something around um I used to do this when I interviewed in, for jobs after college, which is where you take a weakness and then kind of spin it into a positive. And this sounds a little bullshitty because I think the first things I said were better, but you can all, it's worth thinking about for everybody is what's something that is a kind of a, an aspirational thing that you could be doing better. For example, uh, Jeff Bezos says it's always day one at Amazon. So I agree with that philosophy and I'm a little worried that as we grow, we won't be as hungry as we were. And given the staff I have already, it's really hard to find good talent. But I have this mission of always being hungry for day one. But that worries me as we scale. Something like that, right? Or some kind of uh, aspirational thing, you know, like, you know, or something about your mission. Like our mission is to feed all the hungry children in the world. And I just worry that you know, we might not be able to make it. We might only feed a billion children, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I mean, this sounds a little schmarmy, obviously. I'm exaggerating for effect, but maybe there's something in there to for you to chew on. Is that helpful? Thank you so much. I will definitely uh, share good news uh, next month or the, the, the month after. Thank you so yeah. much. I oh, love the you. answers. Great. Very thoughtful. All right. Wise. Awesome. Well, good to see you, Hubert. Thanks for staying up all night. <laughs> um that's this is the internet man you can people all over the world it's fun all right what's going on in the chat room here let's see what have i missed while i've been babbling away here um yes let me put that online uh some folks in the backstage if you want to chat with the general audience you need to go over to the youtube chat or to the linkedin live chat i guess is the linkedin live working i i've been too busy talking to you. it looks like everybody in the chat room is on youtube today have you guys, do we have any LinkedIn folks? I hope so. Um, well, speaking of that, you can watch the replays for this show if you want to see it later. There's a bunch of these online. If you found this interesting, I've been doing this for a while. There's many hours of, of me talking, um, answering questions like this. And uh, it's a free education if you want it. I've spent decades um, building this expertise. Uh, and like I said, I don't have all the answers, but there, I've got a few of them anyway at this point. And be happy to uh, have you watch the replays if that's useful. Let's look in the chat room here. See what am I what am I missing? All right. Um, okay, Iona says if you start off as an LLC, can you change to a C corp in the future? Great question. I have an MVP in early traction, but not sure if I want to seek funding just yet. And like that, an LLC would give me liability protection. Yeah. Uh, yes, Iona, you can do that for sure. 
it's just going to cost you a bunch of money and a bunch of hassle. So I wouldn't do it. want to see full stop 10 years ago there was a variety of different approaches people did c corps in different states or even occasionally in an llc or an s corp but the industry has converged and if you are using an attorney who tells you otherwise they're wrong they uh this is what investors professional venture investors not everybody but professional venture investors want a delaware c corp so i wouldn't waste your time with the llc uh, even if you do it badly on legal zoom or something and incorporate a Delaware C Corp, that would probably, I don't want to beat that drum too hard, but you, I would consider that at least what I would really consider is finding a good attorney and doing it for real, doing those things, uh, the correct way up front can save you so much hassle later. Uh, but I get it. I I've been a founder. You don't have the money. It's, you got to pick, you know, you got to pick <laughs> your issues and, and pay appropriately. Okay. Uh, statutory conversion. Thank you, Retune. I didn't even know that. Statutory conversion. Yes, you can convert. Eve says, hi, Scott. Thanks for the chat. How much equity is reasonable for pre-seed funding of $100,000 to $200,000? So, Eve, that's a great question. It's a whole discussion about valuation, but the short answer is, since we're already over an hour here. Oh, I didn't say, if anybody wants to practice their pitches also, you can come backstage. If any of you are backstage, uh, let's see, we have room backstage. Yeah, we do. Okay, no problem. Um, sorry. Um, Pre-seed funding. Valuation. So valuation at early stage companies, usually uh, tech companies. Again, I'm talking mostly about tech companies today. I'm a software guy. Don't have a lot of expertise on restaurants or nail salons or real estate or whatever else you might be looking at. But for tech-ish companies, first round valuations tend to be $2 million to $4 million. If you are taking, say, $200,000 in on a $2 million company. Um, it's not exactly, but it's roughly 10%. That's kind of the ballpark. Venture investors often have target ownership percentages, so they might want to own 15% of the company or something like that uh, so that they maintain that percentage all the way through till when you hopefully go public. Angel investors tend to be more um, casual about that. We're looking more for, like, if I put 50 grand in, in three or five years, am I going to get 200 out? Awesome. You know, and so then the 50 grand out of 2 million is you can do the math there yourself. Uh, and there's a whole thing about pre money and post money, but we'll skip that for another day. But that's kind of the ballpark. There's lots of information about that online. Uh, go ahead and, and Google that a little bit. Let's see. Uh, Katon, what should be considered? I'm going to do one more here and then Kian, I'll bring you on. Okay. What should be considered more important, finding the customers before the product is launched or focusing more on what customers really want? Or can I only know what customers want after onboarding? That's an interesting question, Kate. Nice to see you. Um, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? I mean, you know, right? That's why you're asking the question. He's trying to stump me. There's no right answer there. It's got to be a back and forth, iterative or recursive even process where you have an idea and then you talk to some customers. They give you some feedback, you refine the product. Then you go talk to the customers again, back and forth, back and forth. That's the way you need to build things. The days of coming up with a genius idea and putting whatever, $2 million in two years into building that and then launching it like it's a movie premiere, like, you know, the Barbie movie <laughs> comes out and boom, you know, you, everybody gets to see it in the same couple days and wow, great. That's not what people do anymore. And you should not be doing that. I, I often meet entrepreneurs and I always feel bad because, you know, I have this idea. I come from this industry and I've seen this problem. So I quit my job and I spent three years and I mortgaged my house and I put half a million dollars and I've got the, the best widget or app or service or whatever it is for this industry. And it's going to solve all the problems. Now I just need investors. I'm like, you just need investors? No, you need customers, right? You need to go out and talk to customers. No investors are going to invest in that anymore. You need to go out and talk to some customers, get some traction showing at least interest and ideally revenue and ideally even profit, as I said earlier, and then investors will be interested. That's how you do it. Um, okay, let me go over to Kian. He's sitting here very patiently and see what Kian has to say. Hello, Kian. Hello. Good. Nice how to meet you. you. Where are you today? I am from Salt Lake okay, City, cool. Utah. Okay, cool. Nice to meet you. Where did you hear about this? Uh, I'm actually not sure. 
LinkedIn, yeah, maybe. maybe. Okay. Nice to see you. So what's on your mind? Nice. So I have a problem. I consider myself non-technical. I mean, I have some scripting um, um, experience, but I started building this platform from scratch uh, through an accident. And I ended up actually building this whole thing with 10,000 lines of JavaScript. Uh, and six months ago, I didn't know what JavaScript was, uh, but now it's working. So um, I, uh, my understanding is that a lot of investors a lot of people, uh, for them to take you seriously, you need to have co-founders. And um, so I started looking for co-founders, technical co-founders. A lot of people are very interested when I talk to them. Every single person literally has been very impressed. And uh, But then they, the question is, what is it that I need to do right now? Because you have a great MVP. You can launch. You can start uh, getting customers. And I haven't mm -hmm. launched yet. Um, and for you to convert it into a scalable platform it's not something you need to do now maybe a year down the line uh, when mm -hmm. you get there so what do i need to do do i still get a co-founder who's technical who could help me down the road now or should i continue launching as a solo founder um yeah, yeah. no it's a great it's, question and, and the congratulations first of all ten thousand lines of JavaScript. good job man um obviously got some horsepower up there good for you um I'm just curious, like, what kind of space is this in? I'm just curious myself. This is in uh, um, a prop tech, a fintech prop tech. So trying to bring real estate investing to more people, make it more accessible. There's a lot of, um, uh, there's a huge barrier. Oh, I lost you for a second. There, if for, for new people to get into real estate, there are a lot of questions, a lot of unknowns, and not many people know much about it. So novice people don't invest in it. I would like to remove that barrier of entry and uh, combine education and ease of analysis um, and finding the right opportunity and make real estate Excellent. available. To great, great market space. Um, one of the reasons I asked is I'm just curious. And the other is, this is for everybody else. It's much more interesting to investors when you target a huge market, right? If he had said, uh, you know, I'm targeting the, the collectible Hot Wheels car space, like that's cool, but that's a pretty limited thing, right? But if you're talking real estate, real estate's everywhere, literally. <laughs> so that's the definition of real estate, right? So that's a good thing. Uh, okay, so let's talk about Keon's questions. Then. So how do you find or present yourself uh, as a company if you don't have a co-founder? That, that's what we're really talking about here. And it's interesting that he's done this technical work himself. I'm talking about you, even though I know you're here <laughs> talking to the audience. Um, you know, how do you position yourself? And this happens a lot with early stage founders. And... I think the answer is kind of a mind shift, uh, a mindset shift uh, to look at it from the investor's point of view. When investors say what they said to Kian, which is um, why don't, uh, at least theoretically, why don't you have a technical co-founder? What they're saying is two things. Of course, we're worried about you scaling and he already covered that, right? We don't know that the, the code is gonna stand up to you know 100,000 users or whatever. So that may or may not be a technical issue. So, um, I got so many thoughts going here. So the, but the other thing they're saying is, does anybody believe you? And that's really what solo founders struggle with is that they've got a vision and they've built something. You're a perfect example of this. You're obviously a smart guy, um, but investors want to know that you can convince somebody other than yourself. So whether it's technical or not, for example, many incubators, as you may know, won't accept teams or companies that don't have at least two or even three people in them because as brilliant as anybody is, I think I said it at the top of the hour, right? Um, remarkable ideas are everywhere. It's implementation that's the challenge. And if you haven't convinced even one other person that this is for real, then why should I believe you and risk my money, right? So that's the subtext of what they're saying. In your case, it's easy because they're saying, oh, you're not techie. Well, then it must be a technical co-founder. Because, of course, that would be great, right? It would also be great if you had a Rolls Royce, right? <laughs> I mean, there's lots of things that would be great or a million users, right? So, But uh, that's what I want to get on the table. What they're really saying is, Keon, you seem cool, but so what? Like you haven't shown that you, you've shown that you can sit by yourself and do something. But this is the grade school thing, right? Does he play well with others? Like who, who else have you convinced? Um, customers are great but it's good to have some other team members. So that's, that's the subtext of what they're saying. And maybe you knew that, but a lot of people miss that. That's what we're really saying is like, if you can't convince me, 
or you say, I have investors. Well, oh, it's your mom. Okay. So you convince, you know, you can do it and your mom believes in you. What a shocker, right? But show me some other people, right? Then the second piece is I would be careful for you and anybody in your position. Um, founder is a big word and founder implies lots of things or co-founder, I should say. You don't want to just give that away. Just like a lot of people come on and say, I need a CTO, right? You, there's only so many yeah. C's in a company. Well, these days there seem to be a lot, but the CTO <laughs> is a thing. You don't just give that away. Just like you don't give away a co-founder. Uh, what I would do if I were you is see if you can convince some other people who are competent and might grow into a really cool role and give them a good title, director of this or VP of that even, but save the co-founder and chief anythings for people who've really shown up consistently. And they've earned the stock that you've granted them using the, the cake equity or the uh, slicing the pie book I showed you guys earlier, right? They should be vesting. And you can do these in small doses early on. You can say, it's just a, let's do a one month thing together. Okay, you hit those milestones, cool. Let's do a one year thing. Great, that worked out. Okay, now you, here's, a, here's a deal together to bring you in as a co-founder because I've worked with you for a year and a half now. We've, we've figured this out, right? Um, the problem, of course, is that the disconnect in expectations, right? If people, especially if you if you invite people as a co-founder, they're going to want, they might want half the company. And if that doesn't match with your expectation, you're immediately setting yourself up for friction. So it's a lot easier, at least in theory, <laughs> to find people on a project basis, hire, engage them for some project thing at a medium level title. And um, hey, if this works out, you know, what we're doing together is experiment in building a ramp so that you can step up to VP or co-founder or CTO or chief marketing officer, whatever their lane is, right? Um, and do that gradually because the alternative is you sign up somebody and, you know, maybe 10% of the time it goes great, but at least 50% of the time it doesn't. And then you've got somebody on your cap table, like what happened to this former founder? Who is this person? They say they're a founder or this was your chief technical officer and they're, they're gone. Why? Right. It, it, you don't want any of that. It's you want to keep things clean. Is that useful? Yeah. Yes. But then if, if they don't come on as a founder, then I would have to pay them. Correct? Probably. That's why we need to see if you can convince okay. people. <laughs> That's exactly what I want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. You got to pay them. It doesn't mean cash. You got to convince them that the equity is worth something or that, uh, you know, you can connect that to milestones. For example, if they have a, a real customer insight or connection and they can bring in that customer, you can pay them in revenue too. It doesn't all have to be equity or, or, you know, the media startup world is all about stock, but cash works. Right. And it may not be cash today. It's a commission sale basically. Right. You say, Oh, your uncle owns that company and they can be our first customer. Great. I'll give you, you know, 30% off the top of that revenue for two years. And then we'll give you stock as well. Like, okay, I'll call my uncle. <laughs> it's worth a call. Right. I mean, it's that's exactly the point, Keon, is we want to see if you can come up with a clever way to make something happen. And it's hard. Yeah. I'm telling you the truth. Nobody will really tell you that. But that's that's what's happening. They're, they're talking about, oh, you need a close. You, you, you need a technical co-founder. But do you think if you walked in tomorrow with a technical co-founder, they're suddenly going to sign? No, they're going to find something else. They're they're vetting you. Right. They're pushing you, making you jump over hurdles that they won't admit are there until they get comfortable enough to mm -hmm. invest. And part of that is getting to know you as well and seeing how you behave in different situations so that they can co create a series of dots that draw a pattern line. And they'll say, ah, OK, he showed up again and again and again. Well, he, he muffed that one up, but then he came back again and again. OK, so now we have a series. I've known the guy for a year now. I think he's for real. That's what they're actually doing, even though nobody will tell you that. <laughs> Got it. Can I ask a related question? On, on the cap table, so or if let's say I bring a co technical co-founder at 50-50 and uh, their share is going to be vested over four or five years, like 10% a year. Um, is that also the case for my shares or immediately my shares are 50% vested because I'm the founder? I came up with the idea. You know, I'm Sure. Good question. Uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, this is legal land and in legal land, you can contract anything. Literally, I mean, people, it's funny because people think the law is like this thing and there are certain rules you have to follow. I, I mean, I guess there are like you can't speed, right? Or you can't kill somebody. But in contract land, I guess it's really contract. Contracts, you can contract anything as long as it's not, you know, mm -hmm. illegal. <laughs> um, so uh, the typical 
to be more helpful, the typical answer would be as a founder, you would probably own the stock yourself. And you may have an agreement, as we talked about earlier, that would grant you what they call restricted stock. And restricted stock would be then, say you had half the company or, or you'd have all the company, I guess, if you're a solo founder until you bring in investors. But that would start vesting back to you over, say, four years. Uh, investors might insist on that, as we discussed earlier. Then when other people come in, it's your decision with legal counsel. This is definitely legal territory, guys. Do not take this at face value. This is complex stuff. There are people that do this all the time. And by the way, don't hire your uncle who does divorce law or your cousin who, you know, does car accident, you know, lawsuits or a litigator. You, if you're going to do this for real, you need somebody who does VC fundings all the time. There are people that do this all day, every day, and they know this shit cold, right? Uh, they're expensive, <laughs> but they are, they, that's, if you're for real, that's what you do. And I can offer recommendations to anybody. They might be on that page. If you go to scottfox.com, no, I actually don't think there's a page that I should put that up actually. Um, sorry, uh, Ken, I'm just trying to be helpful here. Yeah, I don't posted that no, anywhere. No. Um, but you can, you can, um, don't message me through LinkedIn, please. But you can, there's a contact form on scottfox.com. If you, if you need a lawyer recommendation, I know a bunch. Okay. Anyway. Um, so restricted stock units are what are often given, often founders just have founder shares. They have common stock, the founders own. The next step is restricted stock where you kind of grant it to yourself and maybe a co-founder and maybe some vesting and stuff like that. The third is just stock options. And that's what you would do once you have actual like employees and contractors or advisors, maybe you have an advisory board, and then you need an options plan. And, uh, you can mix and remix those in any proportion or time vesting schedule that you like. That makes sense given your context, what your investors are asking for, and um, and you know what your uh, uh, lawyers advise. Um, where did you say you were? Oh, sorry, geographic. You know, okay, so that's U.S. law. Um, so that's this would generally apply. Just for the record, I'm not talking about anything outside the U.S. <laughs> Guys, I'm not sure what it works in other countries, but this is U.S. law. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of idea. Um, and I would just be careful. Like I said, I've said it twice, but I'll say again, when you bring people on, you're getting married. So gradual is better, regardless of what the investors or incubators are claiming they want. They're really just asking you a bunch of stuff. And unless you're really sure, I've seen this so many times, investors, especially engineers, I don't know your background, but I have a good friend who's an engineer and his company, he's like, okay, I had this meeting. They told me they needed this. So I'm going to go do that. And then they're going to invest. So he does it and he comes back and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, Dave, what about this? Oh, shit, now I'm going to go do that. And he goes and does that. And like, oh, well, yeah, that was good too. Good job. How about this? Oh, God damn it. And it's like, this is it, right? But it's really creating that pattern so that they know they trust you enough to invest. So, all right. Uh, You're welcome. Thank nice you so to meet much. you. Hope to see you again. That's our thank friend you. Kian from Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. So um, let's see. We're an hour 17 in here. I think we're going to have to start wrapping this up. Um, let me see. Let me put up some of our, our uh, other. Oh, let me go to the chat room here. Um, okay. Oh, Muhammad's still here from Turkey. Gosh, is it middle of the night there, Muhammad? Let's bring you on for a second and see if you uh, You said. I wasn't sure whether you had a question or not, but you have been very patient. <laughs> Muhammad, yeah, 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 sure. did you actually have a question? You had. It was kind of you were looking to find problems to solve or something like that? Yes, yes. Well, it's not a, a, an investor like question, but it's more of a startup product or a business issue. Okay. Well, let me tell you the story. Like six months ago, uh, I'm 19 and I have four years of uh, software engineering experience. Okay. Well, I got two projects and I didn't have the time to implement them. Uh, so I brought my friends that I know who are technical uh, and we did the, those projects. So it was a four, fourth once of good money, you know, and uh, we made a team, we decided to, because we enjoyed it. And we suddenly found out that we haven't found our niche yet. Uh, we didn't do all these, like the foundation stuff. And we're, we're really struggling in the past two months. And the thing we were struggling is finding our niche. And about the niche, as far as I know, is finding the problem that we can solve that others won't. So, uh, I'd like to ask you, how would you approach that as someone who has experience with the startups, mm -hmm. with the investing and this kind of stuff? So 
I'd like to hear your opinion. And you want to provide software services and create a product? Is that what you're after? Yes, yes. We're doing open services, okay. yes. Okay, so first of all, I would applaud the idea that of turning services into a product, because as we talked about today, services are great, but you, it's kind of you're essentially billing for hourly time, right? And you only have so many hours, so it can't exactly. scale. We're trading the time for the money. yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's great. You can you can get rich doing that, no doubt, but but you can get richer <laughs> if you build a machine, exactly. right? Um, so, that's, that's going yeah. yeah. So okay, so uh, productizing services, so. It sounds to me, and I like I, you know, with everybody else here, I just met you, so I don't know, but you sound like a pretty sharp guy. It sounds like a customer discovery question of talking to um, customers in your target area and seeing what the problems are. You're young enough; it sounds like you don't have particular industry expertise, like you didn't work in the automobile industry or in the manufacturing exactly. groceries or whatever. So you don't have that because a lot of times people solve something from their own industry, right? And you mentioned you have exactly. team members, so. Um, I, I think it's probably a socialization question by which I mean going to some conferences and asking a bunch of people. And the key is to work backwards from something, as we mentioned, uh, I think in Keon's case, a really big market, right? Solve something that's mm -hmm. a really big market so that even if you do a kind of a crappy job, you still <laughs> made a, a small piece of a, a little number times a really big number, still a pretty big number. And investors get excited about that. So I would look at that. But at the same time, you can't, don't be one of those people who tries to build the whole world and can't make any money until they've already have a million users, right? You have to make the first dollar first. And I, you're nodding at everything I say, so you know all this stuff. I'm, I'm just, so this is good. Yeah. So um, maybe the piece I can add then is a bunch of customer research and you can do things online. You can post surveys or ads and get feedback from people. I guess, so that's a thing that people underestimate. There's so much research available not uh, not free, but if you had like, you know, $100, you could buy a bunch of little ads out there and, and post ideas and just see what gets clicked on. Just see if you can generate a spark, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would tend to look for B2B services as opposed to consumer because B2B businesses have much more reliable budgets. And they pay every month. Um, the piece I would add, I guess, that might be a little more unique to my approach is I would look, I would really look at what Muhammad wants to do. Um, uh -huh, you're young enough that you've sounds like you got some great skills did you say you're in turkey i'm originally iranian but i moved to turkey, turkey for okay. Like, okay. Okay. well there's you know growing market interesting you know interesting opportunities there for sure uh and i would look at you know what do you want to be when you grow up honestly right i mean you know do you do you, what kind of people do you like to spend time around like you're really in the cars you know or you wish you spoke french or you like to travel or football, I don't know, girls, you know, whatever it is that you dig, you know, um, and and see how you can design your life around who you want to become. Because with software skills like you have, it sounds like these days you're in exactly the right place, right? Uh, I guess I would add some AI into it because that's mm -hmm. right. That's the trend. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, honestly, my books, uh, especially the last one, Click Millionaires, that's exactly what that book is about. Um, the subtitle is, hold on, Ugh. Work Less, Live More with an Internet Business You Love. I wrote this exactly because I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. This is 12 years old, I guess. Um, but there's a whole bunch of exercises in there that just help you like brainstorm with your partners, your friends, you know, um, what do I, what do I like to do? How does that mix with a, a profitable audience with recurring revenue and how do, what are the tools that I can provide kind of a Venn diagram, you know, overlapping circles. And can, if you can do some research and brainstorm a list of a bunch of those factors, maybe you can find a sweet spot and then experiment and talk to customers. So that's what I would do. I would think about what you want to do because, you can, <laughs> and that's a that's a big change. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. No, actually, one of my books is one of my books. Do you speak Turkish? One of these is in Turkish. Uh, no, no, uh, just English and Persian and Arabic. Oh, okay, sorry, I don't have a Persian one, but this is Turkish, actually. <laughs> nice, nice. Anyway. Uh, last time I was in Istanbul, I was keynoting a conference there. Anyway, okay. Well, nice to meet you. Right. What time is it there? Thank you so much. Uh, well, it's uh, 12, 12 and a half. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Not too late then. All right. Well, nice to meet you. Hope to see you again. 
Good luck. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mohammed. Okay. I think we're going to, well, let me go through the chat room. I think we're going to need to wrap up here. I, I got to go eat lunch guys. Um, but I did want to put this up on the screen. So I've mentioned startupevents.org. So that's the only calendar that I know of, of uh, virtual uh, startup listings. I wonder, you know, I've never tried to share a screen. Maybe I can do that. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can show you I, this. This is for my own entertainment as much as yours, but, but this would bring it live to you. Let's try this here. Share screen. Okay. Can you guys see that? Anybody backstage? Something went wrong. Try reloading the page. All right. Sorry. I'm not going to mess with that live then. Cannot see. All right. Stop sharing. A view tab. Is that it? Well, I can't look at it at the same time, apparently. All right. Well, <laughs> anyway, sorry. That was my experiment on your time. I apologize. Um, okay. So I talked about that one. And then the, um, whatever the chat room. Oh, boy. I broke everything. I'm sorry, folks. Reload. Hold on, gang. Okay. Um, the chat is not, doesn't want to reload though, does it? Okay, I'll just do the chat privately. What's going on here? Okay, sorry, nothing more boring than a webinar where people have technical difficulties. Anyway, uh, so startupevents.org is the first global listing of startup events for founders that are virtual. So even if you don't live in a big city, you can go over and check that out. Startup Investors Directory I talked about, which is the uh, listing of uh, 3,000 plus early stage startup investors. That's just coming out of beta testing. And uh, it's a great place. You can research on all kinds of different factors, like where you live and industry and all that kind of stuff to make it easier for you to find comparables. I didn't talk about this one, which is the third one we're launching. And I've got one more coming <laughs> and then, then, then I'll write my next book. Um, this is about, this is a listing service. This is brand new. Uh, you can go and list your startup. Why? So investors can find you. Uh, I'm trying to put everybody in one place so that you can get attention from investors and they will come to you is the theory, right? And I've done this in other industries, but this is the first time we've done it with founders. So there's a deal on the screen. This one is super cheap too. It's $49 and I think it's half off with that code or something like that. Again, just covering costs because these take a long time to build. But if you want to list your startup, you know, share information about your startup and you can categorize yourself, not just by industry and stage, but by location, geography, and also by other factors. Like if you're a female founder or you're black or you're an immigrant or you're a first time founder or you're a veteran, like trying to get all of those underrepresented groups uh, visibility to give more visibility to everybody so that everybody can participate a little better. That's the deal that's on the screen. All right. So I'm going to wrap up here. I'm going to buzz back through the chat room. I don't know why it won't show on the screen. And let's just see if we can tie this off here. After an hour and a half, let's see. Uh, did that one, did that one. Uh, I did Ketan's. Marvin, what is an acceptable way to calculate what a company would be worth at an exit? Something based on revenue. Yes, uh, Marvin, there's a thousand ways to do that. Uh, so there's uh, a thousand answers, I guess. But they boil down into two buckets. One is... You do some kind of calculation based on revenue or profits and expected growth. And you think about how much money you're making now, how much you'll make in the future, how long that will take. Then you discount the cash flow back to today using current interest rates to think about what the company might be worth. That's a very rough thing. Obviously, you can go to business school and do this a thousand different ways. Another related way would be to look at comparables. Again, find companies like the one that you're interested in and see what they're valued at, right? Because that will be, their valuation will be somehow related to their valuation and multiple of revenues or profits, like I just said. The truth is that it comes down to negotiation. Uh, you need to talk to an investor or an exit acquirer or, and say, I think I'm worth 10 million. And they say, we think you're worth five. <laughs> and then you wrestle. <laughs> so, uh, but generally the, the goalposts or the, the boundaries of the field are somewhere around comparables. 
uh, and revenue calculations. There's a lot of stuff online about that. We can dig into that more if you'd like, but that's the short answer. And uh, what else we got here? LinkedIn is working. Thank you, Andre. Nice to see you. <clears throat> what was the company name? Yeah, with those nice folks who are here. I think they put it backstage. Let me post that and give them some credit. Hold on. I'll find it here. The one with the uh, wellness coaches do, 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 from San Jose, the mental health. I can't. Okay. Well, I, I can't find it. All right. So anyway, mysterious, a mysterious, profitable company. And... Let's see. Vasim has an S corp in Delaware. So Vasim, no, that won't work. It's going to need to be a C corp if you want to raise money. So you can run as an S corp for a while. That's better than running naked. And when I say naked, I mean without the liability protection of a corporation. But investors are not an S corp is a personal property. Essentially, you can't really even have partners. And well, there's some variations, but but you're going to need a C corp at some point. This is where you need counsel, uh, and it's up to your investors. I mean, I, I guess, you know, if it's somebody that knows and trusts you already, maybe they'll give you money in an S Corp, but you're going to get into some weird tax trouble there as well, uh, like how you share the profits and stuff if you're an S Corp. So I, that's, I think you're, I wouldn't say you're in dangerous waters, but I would say that the way you're operating is going to expire at some point. So you probably need to research that. Roxanne says, should an early stage CPG company, that's consumer packaged goods, seek business loans before seeking angel investor funding if they are pre-revenue? Yes, every company should look for loans before equity. Thank you, Roxanne. Giving up parts of your company is stupid. I don't know why that's all we talk about, but yeah. You know, the world ran for centuries, millennia, before corporations were even invested, invented, sorry, invented. I think the first corporation was the Dutch East India Company back in the uh, 17th century in England. And they invented that so they could share profits and risk, right? Uh, but before that, it was always loans. And loans are still by far a much larger part of the economy. So if you have revenue enough in your company to support a loan and you can pay it back without crippling your company, and that gives you enough cash flow to grow, absolutely. Loans, loans, loans. Why do we mostly talk about equity? Well, the media loves it because then people get rich. Um, but also because that's what investors want. That's what I want. I don't want to make you a loan. I want to, I want a piece of your company that's going to turn into Uber <laughs> or Google, right? So loans aren't interesting. So for us, right? So this is very biased information. You got to remember who's, remember who's, who you're talking to all the time, right? Um, Iona, Stripe Atlas seems to be a good option for registering a company. Have you used them before? I have not, Iona, but yes, I've heard that as well. Stripe Atlas is I think uh, Atlas is a service of Stripe and Stripe is the big uh, payroll, uh, sorry, uh, credit card processing company. And I use Stripe a lot. They're, they're a fantastic company. And Atlas is a suite of services that help people incorporate and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Stripe Atlas. Jesse Kaufman, this has been really interesting. Scott, thank you. I'm a therapist who specializes in helping dads with ADHD in the tech startup industry grow in career while staying present at home. Okay, so the dad has ADHD and they're in tech, but they work from home so they can support their family. Nice, that's cool. The tension between sustainable solutions and prioritizing growth has definitely been a theme in sessions and I hear it here too as people seek fundraising. Yes, absolutely, Jesse, that is correct. The tension between, yeah, business and pleasure, it'd be the simple way to, you know, it's, it's more complicated than that or business and lifestyle is, is a hard one and founders wrestle with that, especially if you're doing this as a side hustle. It's really hard to do all these things at once. And that's why most people don't do it, right? You all are a unique crowd. That's why I do this because you are a unique crowd to be here, you know, spending an hour and a half with me at lunchtime and um, thinking about how you can change the world. There's not many people that do that. It's cool. Retune. With the inception of AI, do you believe investors are more interested in solo founders with a strong tech product or a more diverse team of individuals and skill sets? Wow, what an interesting question that is, Ritu. With the inception of AI, do you believe investors are more interested in solo founders with a strong tech product or a more diverse team of individuals and skill sets? Um, I don't know. Every investor is different, but I think I would have to go with the diverse team of individuals and skill sets because the hard part of making money building companies 
is building the company. It's the implementation, the execution, consistent execution over months and years, and maybe even decades. So a brilliant idea with great tech is still going to go nowhere if it doesn't have a team. So I think that most investors, it, it, this depends on the type of investor, people that do pre-seed stuff that are interested in idea, more idea stage people probably will be psyched about the, the AI product with a strong technical founder. I mean, that's a great place to start, right? Both could find great interest from investors, but if you have a strong team, certainly people that invest at seed stage and later are going to be more interested in the team because you can't get the product out the door without a team. Andre says, a big problem with real estate investing is a ton of regulations around the real estate business. You may need a partner who's a licensed real estate professional. This will greatly strengthen your company from an investability perspective. Keon, I think that's addressed toward you. Uh, you're probably aware of that. You may be a broker for all I know. But yeah, it's a good point, Andre. There's a lot of, lot of complexity in real estate. Sarah and Wynn Wise says, after you fund a startup, would you support, advise them in any areas of the business or maybe you, they don't want it? Yeah, Sarah. Well, that's all true, right? Uh, especially at the early stages, a lot of the value that angel investors can provide is mentoring and advisory work. There are quite often investors who come in to provide a specific service even. They might invest in the company and start to head up sales, for example, because they know an industry um, or they're a great coder and they contribute some skills in that way. So sure, this is um, what you're hitting on is back to that world of what I was calling contract land. You can contractually agree to anything. And once you're funding a startup, you are involved. So it's a question usually to the investor what they're willing to offer. Is it just money or is it money and skills or a little money and a lot of skills? And then, of course, as the CEO and the founder, founding team, you need to decide who you want to work with and what kind of advice you want to accept. Investors often have conversations. I've been in this, these rooms a thousand times where the presentation may be great, but we're all concerned about the coachability, the coachability of the founder. Is this person going to listen? They're a genius and she's going to kick some ass, no doubt about it. But when she runs into a wall, will she listen to us so that, you know, we can advise her to avoid that wall or whatever. You get the idea. And that's a definitely uh, an ongoing dynamic. And it changes as the company grows, too. If it's two or three people and my expertise is pre-seed, then I may have a lot to add. If that company succeeds and it grows to 20 or 200 or 2,000 people, I generally back away because I'm not I've worked for those kind of companies. I don't find them interesting. My life, I spend back to the thing with Muhammad, I, I, I've chosen to, what I like to do is work with early stage folks. And um, I literally, when I do advisory work with companies, I usually write it into the contract. There's literally a, a clause that I have that says something like, um, Scott will keep vesting even though his contributions diminish <laughs> as the company grows, because I know that, right? Um, once you've got like a hundred people, you need professional management, you need all kinds of things that I can do and I have done, but I don't enjoy. So but I want to stay on the cap too. All right. Augustin says, should a mobile app business not start as an LLC? Should I have started as a C-Corp? Well, Augustin, that's up to you. But if you're going to raise money from investors, it's a C-Corp. That's the answer. Augustin again says, so are you saying that a business should get a loan first or investors? I assume this falls into a speedster category than what is currently being discussed. Separate category. <laughs> uh, speedster. I like speedster. Um, Yes, Augustine, you're correct. Uh, most, we're, we're talking, I'm painting with very broad brushes here, right? So none of this is to be taken literally. And like I've said a couple of times, it's all uh, more for entertainment than for, um, than for you to rely on. But the question is about um, loans. Loans are better right? Because you don't give a, a piece of the company. So if you can get a loan at reasonable terms that don't cri cripple the company, absolutely. Every time you should take a loan. I, I, can't, I can't think of any exception where that's true. If you think you can repay it and not lose control of the company and grow the company, right? I mean, assuming it makes business sense, a loan is always better because you're not giving up a piece of it, right? Uh, but you're right in this separate category we're mostly i'm mostly talking about high-tech growth startups which can grow like crazy and in those cases they are traditionally funded with equity because they don't have any revenue yet 
right? That's why venture capital exists. If you're going to build a new AI that takes millions, tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars. If you're going to build medical devices or a complex, uh, you're going to create new pharmacological projects, drugs, right? That takes a lot of trials and experiments and, and FDA reporting and filing. It takes years. So these kind of businesses need a lot of capital, even though they have no revenue. And that's why equity comes into play, because nobody will give you a loan when you have, even if you're a brilliant Nobel Prize winning PhD, you have an idea about a drug or an AI or something. Nobody's going to give you a loan on that basis, but people will take a piece of the upside, meaning an equity investment. Uh, Retune, thanks for answering this chat. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Retune. I don't know who you are, but welcome. <laughs> I hope to see you again next month. I do this every month, by the way. Fourth Tuesday of every month at lunchtime, my time, noon in uh, California. And if you want to come again, I hope you will. And uh, let's see. Oh, Keon is a realtor. Nice. Okay. Very good analysis there. And Muhammad says, we appreciate you so much, Scott. Well, thank you, Muhammad. <laughs> that's nice. Nice way to end, at least for me. Uh, I think that's the end of our program today. Uh, let me just remind you. Let's see. What do we have else to say? Comments, likes. Uh, please do all that. Share all that stuff. I appreciate you guys. Like I said, uh, entrepreneurs are my favorite people to hang out with. We're the people that are actually interested in changing ourselves and the world. And most people aren't like that. So congrats to you for being here. I do not have all the answers, but hopefully I gave you some things to think about. I hope you'll be here again. Please share on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, YouTube and tell your friends. We'll do it again. And we have a bunch of other programs. If you haven't already, go sign up here. Learn about the other services that we're building. We're building stuff for you, all free or low cost, trying to get everybody uh, into the game. So that's the end for this time. Thank you all for coming. I hope to see you again. Like and share and uh, tell your friends. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great, uh, great rest of your day.